Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to the Hyperion Hub, your meeting place for all things Disney. Now your hosts. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Hyperion Hub, your meeting place for all things Disney. I'm John Alois, and joined by Sean Degenhart. Here. And John Redling Schaefer. Hello, gentlemen. Before we start the show, I want to let you know we are on social media on Facebook, Instagram, and on Twitter. We're at Hub Hyperion. We'd love to hear from you. Go ahead and email us at podcast at thehyperionhub.com. You can also send us a voice recorded message there. If you're following us on Apple Podcasts, please rate and review us. It does help others find the show. All right. We'd like to start things off with our Disney views. And this week, inspired by our guest, I thought we'd talk a little bit about Disney's famous nine old men. They were a group of animators who worked at the studio from the 1930s through the 1980s. Their nickname comes from what Franklin Roosevelt called the Supreme Court justices at the time when he was frustrated with them. Walt, on the other hand, had... Tremendous admiration for his nine old men and had them involved in every aspect of animation and concepting at the company. Eventually, they expanded their talents to work on theme park attractions. Some of them did. They were Frank Thomas, Ollie Johnston, Les Clark, Mark Davis, Milt Call, Ward Kimball, Eric Larson, John Lounsbury, and Wolfgang Reitherman. Guys, these animators pretty much set the stage for every Disney intellectual property (laughs) for much of its history. And they're still, their talents are still in use today. What do you guys know about the nine old men? Well, I mean, they were not only just animators, but they were creating the animation style um, that we know and love today that everybody else is following through. Um, I read that there were 12 basic principles of animation that they sort of refined. Probably the most famous is the squash and stretch, how the bodies can contort and you know, manipulate their shapes you know, to simulate the motion and exaggeration, timing, all these wonderful things that they just, I mean, they created from scratch. Well, that's what you have to think about is their legacy. You know, you have these 12 uh, basic principles, but you can just imagine... Through the Cal Arts program, I was reading an article where you can trace them through a various apprenticeships down to animators that worked on Frozen and other, really, hits that we know and have seen recently. And that's what's amazing. So not only were they historically important, they continue to be important today. I think they all became Disney legends, uh, which is the equivalent of the Disney Hall of Fame, like in 1989 or something like that. Um, Yeah, just amazing individuals. And also very unique. Uh, Ward Kimball had (laughs) quite a personality. He had a giant train in the backyard. And these guys had uh, other kind of strange hobbies. <laughs> um, you don't usually see a grown man with a full train in his backyard, but I think it was one of the things that made them so talented, probably. They pulled from some of that. You have to imagine that such an amazing brain is never at rest, and you have to wonder what the artist is thinking and what can I do in life to enjoy it to the fullest, and how can I carry that over into my work, and then and also the contrary. What can I bring from my work? over into life. I, I can just see these these gentlemen with their minds spinning constantly with ideas and putting those to paper and putting those to good use. I, I'm sure there was just never a dull moment. And for me, I love the uh, the Firehouse 5 plus 2. <clears throat> um, as a musician, just hearing some of those recordings and uh, it's fantastic. Stuff. Yeah, jazz band yeah. Uh, that they played Most of the time after work, right? Or even like over their lunch break, they'd get together and just jam. They have an album, by the way. I think it's on uh, iTunes. Mm, I'll check that out. Yeah. Didn't know that. We have a real treat this week. We're honored to welcome to the show a special guest. He's a documentary director and producer. He's also a writer. And his father, Frank, was one of the greatest animators who ever lived. It's our pleasure to welcome to the Hyperion Hub... Mr. Ted Thomas, thank you so much for joining us, Ted. It's great to be with you. Before you got into filmmaking, you were raised by a filmmaker. 
uh, Frank Thomas, one of Walt Disney's famous nine old men. He worked at the studio from the mid-1930s to the mid-1980s and virtually contributed to every major project the company produced during that time. So a question you've been asked, I'm sure, many, many times, but I have to ask, what was it like growing up in Southern California with a dad who worked as an animator for Walt Disney? And what was your dad like? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of hard to give a, a short answer to that. You know, uh, a few years ago, uh, the folks at uh, Bonus Features asked me that, that question. So I made a film for them called Growing Up With Nine Old Men. And uh, if, if you can find that, uh, it answers, it goes a little ways to answering your question. But, um, you know, I grew up in the, the 50s and the 60s, and uh, that was a, a terrific time that, uh, you know, for better or worse, doesn't exist anymore. You know, you, you could get by it with uh, your dad went off the work, uh, your mom was a stay at home mom, or probably, uh, you know, get by on one income. There was terrific uh regularity to to life you know in terms of the house getting started and having breakfast together and dad coming home and having dinner together and doing the dishes together and um was, there was a, a lot of family dynamic that went on there in terms of how we felt about uh disney um you know what was special was that you uh, you had the the Sunday night TV show and you had uh, you know e tickets and passes to go to the park uh, in in Anaheim. Um, but beyond that, you know, I I grew up in a community where uh, we were very near JPL, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, wow. uh, there in La Cunada, Flintridge, Pasadena area. And all those folks were involved with uh, the space program. And that was easily as uh, exciting, if not more exciting, than my father working at, at Disney Studios. You know, the idea of going to the moon. All right, that, that's pretty fantastic. So was it not until you were quite a bit older that you realized the significance of who your dad was? Yeah, yeah. yeah. There used to be a, a program of uh, the children of people who had worked at the studio long term uh, could work their summers. And so starting the summer after uh, high school and then through college, I worked their summers and eventually came back and worked full time. Um, and it, was, it wasn't until then that I really got a feeling. And, and so my father was still working there. And... Uh, got a feeling of how other people, his colleagues and peers um, regarded him and how he fit into the whole thing that I began to get a slightly different picture of how important the guy was to the uh, entire operation, which is good in a way, you know, to, to grow up with uh, thinking your father was just a regular guy. You know? Well, I have to ask, you, you were part of the summer program before you started full time. What kind of gig does the kid get in the summer program? Low spot on the totem pole. <laughs> uh, the, the, the first stop, you know, it was very segregated at that time. If, if, uh, if you were a guy, you went into the mail room and it was called traffic. And it was sort of the point of entry for everybody uh, once upon a time. And, you know, you know, the idea was that you delivered mail around the lot and that way you got to know different departments and different people got to know you and uh, you sort of got a feeling for, gee, where would I like to end up? And also the people there started thinking about, hey, you know, he would be good for doing such and such. And, and if, you were, uh, if you were a girl, you uh, were probably in publicity or uh, the steno pool, or maybe accounting. Uh, you know, it was, uh, it was very split at that time, because that was 1969. And, uh, you know, it changed, thank goodness, uh, quite a lot since then. Did your dad bring work home with him? Did he talk about 
the stories he was working on, the projects he was working on at all? He'd bring home work uh, either at the very beginning or the very end of a picture. You know, uh, basically when uh, he had to get work done outside of the time that he spent at the studio. And at the beginning of a project, it was usually because he had been asked to uh, do sort of exploratory animation, uh, getting a feeling for a character. Was a design going to work? Was it going to give you enough acting choices, things like that. And then at the end of the picture, it was always crunch time. You know, that uh, the deadline was looming and work had to be got done. So he'd bring work home then. In terms of talking about work, uh, he, he wouldn't necessarily talk about uh, specific scenes he was working on, but he'd always have a, a story or an anecdote of uh, how things were going or what people talked about or... Um, especially if, if something funny was said, you know, he'd take a walk uh, at uh, lunchtime uh, through the back lot, you know, and, and uh, he'd come home with a story like, hey, you know, they're, they're shooting such and such on the back lot. And I noticed a, a carpenter who had a lot of downtime and he was pounding nails into a board at different heights. And I wondered what the heck he was doing. And then, you know, he, uh, tinged each one with his finger, and it, we, he had him driven in, so they played a melody. Wow. <laughs> you know, they, they, they were tuned. He was like, ding, 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 ding. <laughs> now, your dad was a musician, so I'm sure he fully appreciated when, anytime somebody could take everyday items and turn it into some sort of instrument. <laughs> well, you know, he was a, a great observer, and as he said many, many times, that the, the basis for his approach to animation was observation, you know, really keeping your eyes and ears open to everything that's going on around you. And he, he certainly absorbed everything that happened. I, I loved reading the story about how he developed the Queen of Hearts character, where he saw this woman that was just berating her husband and loud and then would sip her tea very delicately. So you're talking about the observation. That's just a great, great story. He got thrown some very difficult parts during that part of his career, you know, of uh, Queen of Hearts, and that was followed up by uh, uh, Captain Hook. And in both cases, uh, you know, he was sort of left on his own to develop what the personality of the, the villain was going to be. Because the Queen of Hearts comes the closest to being any kind of antagonist there is in, in Alice. And uh, as he had a hard time of it until he saw this, uh, this personality who, you know, sort of flashed between being this very domineering tyrant and then being this uh, uh, coy, dainty little girl. You mentioned what a great observer he was. And I want to get to some of your films that you made, in particular, uh, including Frank and Ollie and, and some of the other animators. But I get a sense because he was such a good observer that your dad probably could have been a good actor. You can see a lot of that personality come out in his interviews and in other uh, things that I've seen him in. Yeah. I think he was first and foremost, uh, an actor and uh, you know, he didn't have any, you know, once he left school, he didn't have any aspirations to be on stage or in front of a camera, but uh, certainly uh, he got to be an actor every time he sat down at the drawing board. And the great thing was that he wasn't constrained by his physical body. You know, uh, one of my, one of the, one of his performances that I've always really liked is the, the doorknob in Alice in Wonderland and how he brought that to life. So we've talked about the acting, the musician, the talent, what sort of, guidance or inspiration or maybe even prodding did you or did not get from your dad growing up towards your own ultimate career decision? I'd say the biggest nudge was uh, find something you get excited by and go for it wholeheartedly, you know. Uh, but the, the advice or the encouragement didn't go a whole lot beyond that. Uh, like he, he never demanded that any of us learn how to draw Mickey Mouse or, uh, or, or, or to do anything with, with visual art. Um, 
when I showed an interest in photography, he certainly encouraged that. Uh, when the, when any of us showed an interest in music, he definitely encouraged that. And he had a deal with us. Uh, he said, look, as long as I can afford it, uh, if you're interested in taking classes on anything, uh, I'll foot the bill. And if you want to go to a school, I'll foot the bill. Just uh, keep studying, keep learning. Uh, and, I, and, you know, that's the, that's the key thing. Because uh, what you need more than anything else in life is curiosity. So go for it. You know, you bring up this story that I read in um, on WaltDisney.org from the Walt Disney Family Museum, and you kind of alluded to it of when you when you told him what you were interested in, and you said some parents, and I'm going to read from their site here. Some parents at that point might have said something like, "Welcome to the world." You know, I think you were bored at whatever you were doing at that point. Uh, grow up. What did you expect? <laughs> But Frank, with a blinding glimpse of uh, the obvious, asked a question that went to the heart of my confusion and in the intervening years has been very revealing to me about him and his employer, Walt Disney. Frank asked, what if you were doing something you really liked? That's the type of dad I think we all want, you know? (laughs) That's incredible. Yeah, I can still remember... uh that conversation pretty vividly. We were up in the mountains at the, the, the uh, summer place that uh, he and, and Ollie bought together. Of course, they did everything together. And uh, I was, you know, I had another year to go in college. And a lot of my great conversations with Frank happened while we were uh, physically working, doing outdoor work. And, you know, I think we were building a, a, a rock wall or something like that. And, uh, you know, I was sort of bemoaning the fact that I only had one year left to sort of hide out in college <laughs> and uh, uh, dreaded the prospect of, you know, most of the, the work opportunities out there because I just hadn't thought far enough. And that was when he brought up this phrase, you know, the, or this question, well, what if you're doing something you really enjoyed? Hmm. And I thought, oh, okay, that's my marching <laughs> orders now. <laughs> You mentioned Ollie. Talk a little bit about their relationship and friendship and how that developed and was cultivated through the years. It was one in a million. And uh, th- there have been other friendships like it, other creative friendships. Uh, they met each other when they were 19 years old. And for the rest of their lives, they either roomed together or uh, took classes together or carpooled together or lived next door to each other. So um, it's a pretty remarkable friendship. And it was based upon, I, I think what sustained it was the fact that they were both wildly interested in art and making things. Uh, although at one point, you know, Ollie was interested in journalism and Frank thought he was interested in industrial design. And uh, when Frank uh, graduated ahead of uh, Ollie, he went to art school in Los Angeles and Ollie came down with the Stanford football team for the Rose Bowl, saw what Frank was doing and said, "Uh, this is more interesting than being in college. I'm going to move to L.A. So he did. He left school. He left uh, left Stanford with one term left to graduate. So he he often joked that he was, uh, you know, Stanford's most successful dropout. <laughs> and the incredible thing was their their creative dynamic because I think they both respected each other's talents, but they also understood each other's. Uh, well, I hesitate to use the word limitations, but um, you know, parts of per- parts of their personalities that were not as strong as other parts of their personalities, I guess you'd say. And uh, that's really unusual in a friendship. You know, it's sort of the secret sauce that you see in really successful uh, relationships, you know, where people are together uh, for a long, long period of time, is that they're able to give each other slack and uh, respect each other and be cheerleaders for each other. And and Frank and Ollie had that in their 
their working relationship. And because of that, I think that, you know, well, that's the thesis behind the, my film, Frank and Ollie, was that the, the two of them working together lifted each other up to a, a higher level than either one of them could have achieved individually. I want to ask about that film. So it came out in 1995 and mm -hmm. uh, it, Frank and Ollie, and you directed it, and I believe you wrote it and produced it. And uh, it, it's a wonderful look at two families, really, not just Frank and Ollie, but just how close um, your mom was with Ollie's wife. And, and they mm -hmm. lived right next door to each other. Next door to each other, yeah. And their, their, yeah. their houses were similar in different, you know, in, in, in their houses were similar in different, different ways. ways. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Very astute, yes. <laughs> I like it. I like it. Go with it. <laughs> They had, well, that's sort of, that just sort of describes Frank and Ollie, too. <laughs> they're, they're, they're Maybe really I'll leave that in there. Yeah. It's, it's just a wonderful look at, at the two of them. <laughs> and how did that come about? Did Disney approach you? I mean, they're probably two of the most famous animators in the history of Hollywood. And, and popular, you know, well-liked. That film, more than any other I've made, was uh, a hard, hard sell. Uh, and, and, you know, in retrospect, it, it may seem ironic that it was so difficult to make. But um, when I started out, uh, I thought it was going to be sort of a quirky human interest piece that I pitched to uh, the National Geographic channel because they were just starting up and I had done some work for them. And, and uh, I thought, isn't it interesting that these two guys knew each other so long and they've got so many similarities? And anyway, they passed. They didn't want it. And uh, so then I thought, well, I'll take it to the, the, the Disney Channel because I had done a project for them a few years before. They didn't want it. Then the more I worked on it, I thought, well, you know, uh, there's really a lot more to say here than just the, the quirky stuff of, uh, you know, working at the same place and living next door to each other and carpooling, et cetera. So it's like, it, it's really a, a bigger story. So the more I worked on it, the bigger it got. And I wanted to make it as an independent film. And uh, in terms of raising the money for it, it always came back to, well, can you uh, get the clips from Disney? And so then I'd go back to Disney and uh, they'd say, well, we're not really interested. And uh, then, then they were interested, but they weren't going to give me the clips because I was asking for too much. And, you know, and then this is like three, four years had gone on by this time. And uh, the other hurdle was I had to convince Frank and Ollie that they were interesting enough <laughs> to, 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 to sustain a 90-minute film. They said, well, gee, I, I don't know, you know. So anyway, long story short, uh, my, my fairy godfather, if you will, eventually was... Uh, Roy E. Disney, who uh, understood the project and saw enough virtue in it that uh, he didn't he didn't wave a magic wand, but he he uh, helped me out enough that I was able to broker uh, a negative pickup deal with with the studio, whereby uh, I would get to make the picture that I wanted to make and. Uh, I could raise the money with the promise of uh, uh, a check being delivered to me when I delivered the movie to cover my costs, and it would be owned by the studio. Well, you know, that's not an ideal situation for an independent filmmaker, but it was one that, that got the movie made. And thank goodness, because here we are now, gee, is it 25 years since it came out? Yeah. But, you know, it's still... People who know the film enjoy it. People who discover it, you know, feel like they've, wow, I've stumbled upon something terrific. So I'm very, very happy that it's a, a story and a film that has held up this long. Uh, well, thank you for remaining persistent because it's a wonderful film and, and we love watching it. <laughs> well, and that's that's exactly what I want to touch upon, John. I mean, it, it is two legends, in essence, walking us through the ups and downs of an icon, you know, the the studios themselves. And even just their acting out certain scenes, you know, I, I just love, you know, from from a, of our most basic standpoint, two folks on the ground 
sharing their take on the history of such an important, again, icon, company in our country's history. And yeah, my goodness, thank you so much for your persistence. <laughs> well, I, I, well, you're welcome. Uh, All right, well, I, I we're like done the then. I, uh... <laughs> I feel pretty good about it, too. <laughs> Yeah, I like to joke that that uh, it took me seven years to make the film, and and just it happens that it took seven years to make Bambi too. So yeah, coincidence? Yeah. <laughs> uh, Roy E. Disney seems to have been a champion for helping preserve a lot of that history um, through your project and other things that he was involved with. Is there anyone there now? that you can think of that is such a big champion for helping preserve this legacy? Well, it, it's, um, uh, it's hard because, um, you know, companies, whoever they are, uh, are committed to, um, plowing ahead with the future. And, and certainly Disney as a company uh, has always been focused on the, the future. Uh, thank goodness that during Walt's lifetime and, and shortly after, there was enough awareness of wanting to hang on to uh, what they had created so that over time th there was uh, an archives that you could turn to and, and uh, sort of reconstruct events that had happened. Um, I mean, the, the person whose praises I would sing more than any who are there now are um, Howard Green, who has been uh, there since the, the mid-70s and is uh, really the patron saint of, of ancient history. And then um, Becky Klein, who, who runs the uh, archives department, has been there uh, long enough to uh, really have a sense of who was who and what went on. And, and as the, the Disney universe grows, is still able to have a feeling of how all the different parts are, are connected. You know, that uh, it didn't just begin with, uh, you know, Fox coming into the family or Marvel coming into the family. Like and that's that. one thing I've enjoyed about Disney Plus is that we now have one place where we can go for shows like Frank and Ollie and like the mm -hmm. prop culture and all the behind the scenes. The things. Imagineering documentary the Imagineering show. documentary. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a, a great wonderful platform. resource. Well, I, you know, I'd say with, with Roy's help... We, we were the first out of the gate in terms of doing a, a nonfiction project in connection with the, the studio. Because, you know, forget the fact that the True Life Adventures had, had been done back in the 50s and, and early 60s. By the time I came along in the early 90s to, to try and do this project, the response was, well, we don't do that. You know, we don't have a template for that. Uh, and so fortunately, we were able to get the film made, and then Leslie Iwerks was able to get her mm -hmm. picture about her, her grandfather made, and then that sort of opened the door for Don Hahn and the Sherman uh, brothers to do their films. Uh, I, I'm so glad that that avenue did open up, because as you've pointed out, uh, there are a lot of terrific legacy stories still to be told. And there's more to Ted's story, but that'll come next week when Ted talks about his films, Walt and El Grupo, and Growing Up with the Nine Old Men. We'll also hear about Ted's approach to documentary filmmaking. Thanks for listening, everybody. If you listen to us on Apple Podcasts, please rate and review us. It really does help people find the show. We encourage you to email us, podcast at thehyperionhub.com. We have a guest coming up soon. And it was all set up because a listener sent us a wonderful email. More about that later. Thanks, everybody. Have a great week. We're glad you could join us. We'd love to hear from you. You can email or send us a recorded audio message at podcast at thehyperionhub.com. Find us on social media on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. The Hyperion Hub is not affiliated with the Walt Disney Company or its subsidiaries. We'll meet you next time at the Hyperion Hub. Yeah.